Good to see everybody here today. Um, we're going to be uh, looking into the uh, book of Philippians again this morning. And get this going, and hopefully I'll do it in the right order today so that I don't have any problems. And you can turn to chapter 2, or 3, I should say, um, of Philippians. And we're going to look at uh, verses 17 through 21 this morning. That work, Don, thank you. Verses 17 through 21. And I would ask the question this morning, uh, who is influencing you? Um, both in, 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 a, in a general sense, but also especially... Uh, in a spiritual sense, who is influencing you? And uh, I think it's an important question that all of us need to ask uh, as we go through life. Um, we come into contact with many, many people, don't we, over time? And uh, some of which we become closer with than others. We befriend them or they become, you know, closer acquaintances. And uh, these people, uh, whether we, we uh, realize it or not, uh, have an influence on us, don't they? Whether it's negative or positive. Uh, hopefully it's a positive influence. Now, I know when I was in school, in high school, um, I was a believer. I became a believer when I was around 10, but... When I was in, in high school, I went through a, a stage where the influences that I had in my life were not good. There were those that were influencing me uh, to go down a path that was completely contrary to Scripture and to, uh, to, uh, for someone that loved the Lord and, and was a believer. So friends and acquaintances can have an impact on us for sure and this letter was written to the philippian believers this was written to believers here and because scripture is timeless of course it is uh, to us as well and in this section of his letter paul is exhorting uh, all believers to be very careful as to who is influencing us spiritually and in verse 17, the Apostle Paul, of course, under the guidance and inspiration of the Holy Spirit, these weren't just his words that he thought of off the top of his head, but under the inspiration and of the Holy Spirit, he gives us very good counsel and, and in essence says it is very wise for us to seek for and imitate upright examples and, and that would be especially in, in, as, as believers and in, in, in especially regarding spiritual things. It says there, brethren, or really brothers and sisters in the Lord, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. Now right out the gate, this may sound like Paul is is kind of pompous and saying, you know, you follow what I do and you'll be all right. But remember, he's under the direction of the Holy Spirit here. He has, he has been compelled to write this in this way. And he's saying, follow my example. And he addresses them and all of us as brethren or brothers and sisters in the Lord. And this is a very gentle uh, intimate, affectionate, loving term. Paul uses this often in, in Scripture, in his writings, when addressing fellow believers, because we are all, if we are believers, brothers and sisters in the Lord, aren't we? And that's the way we should address each other, as those that we love and care about. And so, 
you know, what he was about to say was being said to them in a gentle and loving and kind manner because he cared for them. He loved them deeply. And he says, join in following my example. It reads in the, in the Greek test, text, be fellow imitators with me. And I think that really uh, c- conveys the thought maybe a little bit better. Be fellow imitators with me. Imitators of what? Well, imitators of Christ, right? Of, of being Christ-like. So he set forth you know, his life of mission already uh, previously in this, in this chapter to be more Christ-like. His pursuit was, his passion was to be, become more Christ-like in his life. And Paul then did not hesitate in any way to tell the Philippians to follow his example, to imitate him. Now, he doesn't mean that they should imitate every single thing he does, down to every act he he does, uh, every area of his life. He was not sinlessly perfect, obviously. He was a man, just like we are human beings. And uh, he was not putting himself on a pedestal of spiritual you know, perfection by any means. He was simply encouraging the Philippians here and all of us to follow his example of someone who was in no way perfect but was relentlessly pursuing the goal of Christ's likeness. And that's an honorable pursuit, isn't it? And so he was encouraging us to join him. In the power of the Holy Spirit by pursuing a life that is more Christ-like, a life of virtue, uh, a life of morality, a life of purity, of holiness, a life of, of overcoming the flesh and having victory over temptation and sin, uh, a life of, of true worship, a life of true devotion to the Lord, a life of true service for the Lord, uh, to pursue a life of patience and endurance in difficult times, um, to pursue a life that has a proper perspective about things, that knows, for instance, how to handle possessions and, and, and uh, money, uh, a life that is, uh, is one that is is uh, uh, having uh, good relationships and uh, sound and healthy relationships, whether it be marriage or friendships or whatever. That's what he's saying. Pursue my example in that pursuit that I have to do those things. And then Paul moves beyond himself here, and he, he exhorts us also to observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. Or really observe those who live after the pattern we have set for you. That's really what he's saying here. And observe has the thought of fixing your gaze on. Or focusing on those who walk this way. Whose daily conduct is in accordance to the correct pattern. The one you have in us. The one that is pursuing Christ's likeness. And this, so this refers to any other person who, like Paul, was relentlessly pursuing Christ's likeness. Observe them, it says, with purpose to follow in their steps, to imitate them. So what are some of the, con- uh, the characteristics of uh, 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 you know, that we will observe and that we should imitate in the lives of those who are pursuing Christ's likeness. What, what do they look like? What do people like that look like? Well, first of all, they have a love and devotion for Christ. They're believers, first and foremost, and they have a love and devotion for Christ. I believe, and I don't think you can really separate any of these things. I believe it's a package. I believe it, one that is pursuing Christ is living a life of humility, who doesn't put themselves up on a pedestal, 
and, and they're not proud and arrogant, but the humble. Um, I believe it. someone who is uh, 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 exhibiting unselfish service, someone who is eager to serve others. If you see someone who is perhaps very zealous, but not eager to serve others, and perhaps not uh, humble, then I think w there's a question there about their character, isn't there? But one is devoted to Christ, who is humble, who is eager to serve, serve who is filled with sacrificial love and dedication and all of those types of things, I believe that is what will be evident in the, in the life of one who is sincerely pursuing and, and successful in pursuing Christ-likeness. I think we can also observe that there, uh, that, they are, that there is spiritual growth, that someone is growing in the Lord because of their consistent uh, study of the Word of God. I think you're going to observe a life of holiness and purity and morality. You're also going to, I believe, see, and this I think is very important, you're going to see one whose worldview is greatly influenced by God's word rather than the world. What is, what is in, influencing your worldview this morning? Is it God's word or is it the world? And a person who is sincerely pursuing Christ is concerned about God's word, and that's going to influence how we think, isn't it? It's going to give us a whole different perspective on the world itself and, and, and what we do in this world. So these are some things that we could observe in a person who is uh, living according to the pattern you have in us. In other words, living a life that is pursuing Christ. You know, when, I don't know about you, but I used to do this, uh, I would imitate my brother. You know, if he would do something, I would try to do it exactly the way he did it. Sometimes it got a little bit annoying, especially when you would, like, repeat the words that he said. You know, I'm going to go outside. I'm going to go outside. You know, those types of things. As a sibling, you kind of, I remember uh, our younger uh, boys, or especially Joel, uh, he observed his brothers playing basketball, and he would imitate what they did. And so he was able to do things uh, ahead of what they did things because he had their example before them, and he would observe it, and he studied. Even, even maybe he wasn't even thinking about it, but he would then go out and do the things that they would do. And that's kind of the thought here, is in observing and imitating those who are walking or living according to the pattern that's set before us. So Paul then goes on to give further counsel here. And this, that was the positive side. Now, now we have the negative side. He says, be aware of unhealthy examples. Be very aware of that. And he says here, for there are many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even in tears who walk or live as enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. There were many in Paul's day that, that followed him around for the sole purpose of derailing and disrupting his ministry. Can you imagine that that's your sole goal, is to disrupt and derail what someone is trying to accomplish? And we know that the, the thing Paul was trying to accomplish was to spread the gospel. He was trying to tell people about the Lord Jesus. But there were people that went behind him and spread all kinds of discord. Don't believe him. Christ's work isn't sufficient, whatever. The Judaizers and there were other Gnostics and whatever else. All kinds of different elements that were trying to upend what Paul's message was. And he was, they were misleading uh, the people that he was trying to minister to. 
and it made him obviously very sad. He said, you know, I bring this up, and, I, and it, when I do, when I think about it, it makes me cry. It makes me weep because it's, it's so upsetting to me. And, you know, we live, obviously, in a different time than Paul did. But there are those who would seek to influence us today in a very negative way as well. Uh, and sadly, uh, in, 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 in this case that Paul was addressing the Philippians, it, were, it was people that was actually in the church. And I say that that's happening today as well, unfortunately. Um, some can be a bad influence in the church even. And Paul gives us a description of those who he says we should not allow to ma manipulate us or sway our thoughts. And unlike the godly examples that we have, uh, that we just covered, that we're encouraged to imitate in verses 17, these people walk or their daily conduct is not to be imitated. It's not to be followed in any way, and we'll see why here, because they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Why on earth as believers would we want to follow the lead of someone who is an enemy of the cross of Christ? The cross of Christ, what does that, what does that imply? Well, it signifies all the aspects of Christ's atoning death and resurrection. Everything about his person and his work. That's what is implied here. They're enemies of the cross of Christ. In other words, they're enemies of Christ. And in what ways are they or can they be enemies of Christ? Well, obviously, uh, the most obvious would be those who completely reject the whole concept or thought of Christ as being the Son of God who came to earth and gave his life on the cross and died there for our sins. So they deny the very person and work of Jesus Christ on the cross and reject the salvation by grace through faith that is in Jesus Christ. That's the obvious, uh, most uh, obvious way of being an enemy of the cross of Christ. But then there are those also who are a little bit more subtle. They may say, yes, Jesus died on the cross, and I believe that he did that. However, his faith in him is not sufficient. There needs to be other things added to it, other works, other methods, uh, other, other things. Or they say that, yes, I believe he died, but his work isn't sufficient to completely save us. We must add something to it. We must add something to it. Saving faith, then, is Jesus, in their estimation, plus works, methods, rituals, so on, so forth. And that's a very dangerous message, but it's out there, and it can influence us to, to in some way, lessen the work of Christ. And then there are those who... Would And this is, I think, particularly what he's referring to here because there was a, a group of people in that day that were going around and spreading this thought and that was turning liberty into license. In other words, they were spreading the concept that because Jesus paid for our sins and we have put our trust in him, you can live in any manner you choose. doesn't matter how, what you do. Saving faith does not need to result in holy living because your sins are all paid for. In other words, sin or do whatever you want so that grace may abound. We know <clears throat> that Romans says, shall we sin, that grace may abound. And it says, heaven forbid that we even have that thought. <clears throat> Excuse me. But that was... That was their rationale, using grace to, as an excuse for the rationalization to do whatever we, they wanted to do. Again, enemies of the cross, because they were not following after what uh, it was true in Scripture. So enemies of the cross, I think, can be easily marked. If someone is either adding human works to the gospel, 
or subtracting from it, stripping the cross of Christ of its power to transform lives. And I think that person can be classified as an enemy of the cross of Christ. And I think we need to be very, very careful today as, as never before because all we need to do is go and click on our phones and we can bring up countless YouTube messages of preachers all over the place. And that, believe me, there are those out there that are nothing less than heretics in my estimation in terms of what they're proclaiming. They are undermining the person and work of Jesus Christ by what they're saying. And we have to be very careful what we listen to in that regard. It says, there are many who walk as enemies of the cross of Christ, who live as enemies. And he warns us of these things with weeping. In other words, because he knew well the spiritual harm that they can do in a church. He was bringing this up to them with tears in his eyes. Lives could be ruined, spiritually derailed, and also because of the reproach they bring on the name of the Lord, the way that they obscure the true and simple message of the cross. All of these things uh, come to thought here. Those who do not recognize the all-sufficiency of Christ and reject the one and only truth of salvation through him and him alone are enemies of the cross of Christ because their, their, their direct attack against the Lord Jesus and his finished work on the cross. Pretty clear. Enemies of the cross, to beware of them. And then there's three additional uh, descriptions given here uh, in this passage of uh, who, who the enemies of the cross are, how they manifest themselves as to what they are, what they're ruled by. And uh, it says their God is their appetite. Now, I have a healthy appetite. But this isn't exactly what it's talking about here. It's not specifically talking about food. Uh, the, the word appetite here is uh, the thought of the, the center of our thoughts, feelings, and choices. So in other words, their God is how they feel, uh, how they think, and what they choose to do. That's their God. It's all about them, in other words. Uh, the only thing that occupies their thoughts would be their, uh, their thoughts and feelings and choices is their physical desire and cravings. They have the mindset, how can I indulge myself? And this would include all unrestrained, unrestrained fleshly urges, and this would include gluttony, of course. The thought here, however, is because they have no thought to worship and honor God, the only thing that drives them, the only thing that they bow to is their physical impulses. That is their God. And it says to beware of an association with someone like that. Scripture gives us further insight into them. It says, for such men are slaves, not of the Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. Beware of one whose only thought is their own selfish impulses and desires. Jude 4 says they are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. 
Paul goes on. He says, whose glory is in their shame, or they glory in their shame, or they brag about the shameful things they do, really, is what it's saying here. Instead of giving glory to God, these enemies of the cross of Christ heap praise on themselves, priding themselves in the things they should be ashamed of. They boast in the very things that bring them shame, their immoral and wanton appetite. And you know, if you think about it, this is, this is an extreme uh, form of wickedness, isn't it? When, one, when one's most wretched and sinful conduct before God is the highest point in their estimation of their self-exaltation. Something to brag about. I did this, which is sinful and awful, and I'm going to brag about it as something I'm so proud about. Do we not see that in our world today? They boast about it. Beware of one who does that in terms of influencing you as a believer. And it goes on. It says, who set their minds on earthly things. Or, in other words, they think only about this life here on earth. That's their only thought. There's no thought for anything upward. It's all here, now. They're occupied with earthly things. Enemies of the cross of Christ. The important things to them is everything the world has to offer here and now. Beware of that. They're not concerned with the things that are, have eternal value in any sense. They live as if they live on earth and will live on earth forever. And we know, of course, that is not true. Scripture tells us, as believers, to do just the opposite. In, in Colossians 3.2, it says, Set your mind on the things above, not on things that are on the earth. It's pretty clear, isn't it? And then Paul gives us the destiny of those who are enemies of the cross of Christ. It says, whose end is destruction. Or in other words, they are headed for destruction. And this word destruction here uh, does not mean annihilation. For some, that would be a sense of, of uh, calm, wouldn't it? In the end, I'm just going to get annihilated, so it doesn't matter what I do or what I think. I'm just going to go away. Well, no, that's not what this word means. This word means ruination. And ruination, by being separated from the presence of God in eternal judgment forever. That's what that's, that word means here. So it isn't that we just go away. It's that we'll spend eternity in misery and torment and punishment, separated from God in the lake of fire. That's the end of those who truly are enemies of the cross of Christ, who are not believers, in other words. This is precisely why we should not in any way follow them or support them or imitate them. Certainly we can witness to them, can't we? But we should not imitate them. We are, as we have been told, to imitate godly examples in our lives. So not only then are we to follow the lead of godly people and beware of godless people who can influence us negatively, we are to focus on heaven. We're to have our eyes above. And it says, for our citizenship is in heaven from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. <clears throat> our citizenship is in heaven. Sometimes I think we, we live as though it's here, but it isn't. Uh, the people of Philippi were living in their, uh, where they lived 
as colonists while their citizenship was in Rome. And in a similar way as believers, we live out our lives here on, excuse me, here on earth, but our citizenship, our real citizenship, is in heaven. And I think this, the truth of that shows the contrast between those who, in verse 19, are enemies of the cross, their minds are exclusively on earthly things, with those who should be and are, as true believers, heavenly minded, have a heavenly minded attitude. It is consistent for us as believers to have a heavenly focus then because that's where our citizenship is, right? It just makes sense. And that refers, citizenship here refers to uh, a place where one has official status, uh, where one has his or her name recorded on a register as being a citizen. And though we as believers live here on this earth, we are citizens of heaven. Members of Christ's kingdom. Scripture tells us, again, that we're on a register. Our names have been recorded in heaven as those who are believers. All right, that's where our citizenship is. So why have this heavenly focus as believers while we're living here on earth instead of being occupied and caught up with everything that's going on here? Why should we put our focus on heaven? Well, our inheritance is there. Ultimately, that's where we're going to spend eternity, right? Our reward is there, the crown of righteousness, among other things. Our treasure is there. And most importantly, our Savior is there. We want to go to be with him, don't we, ultimately? So why would we focus on heaven? Well, that's where our Savior, the prime motivation for pursuing Christ-likeness here on this earth is the hope of the return of Christ to take us to be with himself. Since Christ is in heaven, we who love him must be preoccupied then with heaven, focus on heaven. That's where our citizenship is, longing for him to return and take us to be with him in heaven, to be with him and like him for all eternity. Because it is from heaven, as it says here, that we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come. And he is going to come one day with a shout. And in a twinkling of an eye, we're going to be ushered out of here and changed instantly into his likeness. He's coming. As believers, we're not to wait for him with the thought of, of you know, with his return with an attitude of, of apathy or disinterest. We instead are to eagerly wait for a savior. What is it? mean to eagerly wait? Well, that word in, in the Greek describes someone who is on their tiptoes and head extended, anticipating, longing for something. And it's combined with patience. And in this case, we're in essence on our tiptoes. We're anticipating the rapture of the church. We're anticipating the taking away of all true believers to be in glory. I remember when I would uh, expect my dad to come home from work, I'd stand at the end of the road sometime and, and look and look and look to see that truck coming. I was, in essence, just stretching out, like couldn't wait to see him. And that's the thought here is to have that anticipation, that eagerness. Are we eager, or are we liking the world so much that we hope he doesn't come? That's the question as believers. And again, we need to be aware of those who would influence us uh, away from this focus of heaven. 
And this, uh, this event, this rapture, this home call, will end our struggle as believers in the pursuit of Christ-likeness, won't it? Because in a flash, in, a, in just a blink of an eye or less, the Lord will, as it says here, transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory. Think about that. Think about that. Our sinful, wretched selves, as we are, with all the stuff that we struggle with, is instantly going to be changed. And we're going to be transformed into the likeness of his body of glory. Think about that. What a, what a transformation. What a thing to look forward to. The long-awaited redemption of the body. What a thing to wait for, be waiting for with anticipation. Christ will totally transform every believer to make us fit for heaven. We couldn't be in heaven like this. He's going to make us fit for heaven. The Lord will change these bodies that are now subject to aging, sickness, sin, death, into conformity with the body of his glory. And you know, we don't know the fullness of what that means or what it will be like. We can't even, I can't wrap my head around everything about that. But we do know that our glorified bodies will be real. It's going to be a real experience. It's not just something that's mystical or magical. It's going to be a real experience. We're going to be really transformed and we're going to have real bodies. No, but what's the wonderful thing about it is that we will be no longer subject to sin, we're no longer subject to decay and death, perfectly suited for heaven, forever free from sin and morally pure like the Lord Jesus. That would be a wonderful day when we're transformed into that. 1 Corinthians 15 speaks of that. And i uh, just going to read that quickly here. 1 Corinthians 15. It says in verse 51, Behold, I am telling you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this is perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable puts on imperishable and this mortal puts on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. What a, what a day of victory that will be when we're transformed. And the Lord Jesus is the only one who can save us. There are many out there that are preaching a gospel that there are many ways it's not who you believe, it's how sincere you believe it. That is a lie. There is only one one, only one who can save us, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one who can help us through life, assist us. There is only one who can keep us saved. And there's only one who can transform us, transform these humble bodies into his likeness. There's only one who can do that. And this transformation, as we see here in this passage, will be brought by, brought to pass by divine power. Divine power, like we can't even comprehend. The same divine power that the Lord will use in time to subject all things to himself. One day, all things will be subject to him. One day, the Lord Jesus Christ, every knee will bow to him, and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. 
everything will be under subjection to him one day. That power that will bring that to pass is the power that's going to change us. You think he can change us? You think he's able? Well, if Christ can arrange an order of rank the entire universe to his sovereign control, then he certainly can and will, by the power that he has, transform our bodies into his image. We can be confident of that. Scripture tells us that we can be confident of that fact. So then, just in closing, three takeaways. In our pursuit of Christ-likeness, we should look to godly examples for our inspiration and motivation and instruction. There are godly examples to, for us to follow out there. Let's make sure that that's, that's the, the ones that are influencing our lives. Secondly, we should always be on guard for those who are enemies of the cross of Christ. Enemies of the truth who would lead us, lead us down the wrong path and, you know, it says to, to be aware of them. Just be aware that they're out there. And one of the ways that we can be aware is to be getting into the word of God so we know what we believe. We know what the truth is based on what scripture says. There are many out there that would attempt to mislead us spiritually. And then finally... We should focus on the wonderful and glorious hope that we have uh, of the return of Christ for us. And, and the, the fact that at that moment, in a flash, we will be transformed uh, into uh, conformity with the Lord Jesus. Fully suited to reside in the in eternal, holy glory and joy of heaven. What a, what a, what a day that will be. I pray that every, everyone here in this room this morning that has heard this, um, in terms of being a Christian, being a born-again Christian, I hope you know the Lord this morning and have placed your trust and faith in Him. It's the most important decision anyone will ever make. He gave His life for you and for me. I accepted him when I was 10 years old at a, at a funeral of a friend of mine that died at 16, suddenly of a heart attack. And it so touched me when the preacher said, if that would have been you, where would you be? And I'll tell you what, that makes you think. And I thought, and I accepted Christ, and I have never regretted that. He's worked on me since. <laughs> But how about you? Do you know the Lord this morning? I pray you do. If you have any questions about that, I'd be glad to talk to you. And I know Norm would too. Think about it. Think about where you'll spend eternity this morning. The Lord Jesus loves you. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for this time in your word. And uh, we just ask your blessing on it. And... Uh, we ask your blessing on the service to follow as well. And may we truly uh, have a, a time of reflection and remembrance this morning of our Savior. So we praise you and thank you and commit all into your care now in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>